And he was a Christian. And he was um, ministry minded. But he struggled in this conversation with how, you know how we as Christians can get into a legalistic rut where we try to be good for the sake of being good without the desire of the heart to be good? You know, that legalism that, that Jesus warns of the Pharisees? And, and he was telling me in this conversation, you know, I just need to focus on the big things. I don't want to focus on the little things. And I'm like, okay. So do you struggle with any of the Ten Commandments? Do you have a problem with stealing? Uh, do you have a problem with murder? Do you have a problem with coveting your neighbor's wife? These are the big things. No. So if you don't have a problem with the big things, then why can't we work on the small things? You know, the, the, the speck of dust in our eye, you know. Because if you don't have a plank in your eye, then we need to work on the dust in our eye. And it, it's really not meant to be a legalistic thing, but a heartfelt thing. And so this morning, we are going to talk about advice on godly living in this world. Did anybody here think it's hard to have godly living in this world? It is an interesting idea because in some areas it's supposed to be easy. Some areas it's not supposed to be hard. But sometimes we get in our way of ourselves and we make it hard. Or we get in the way of ourselves and choose not to do what God has asked us to do. So this morning we are going to take a, a gander at this kind of stuff. So most of this message is going to be in, in the book of Titus. Uh, but there's just a key verse, not a key verse, just a verse for this slide. For one who wants to love life and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. First Peter 3, verse 10. We're going to jump right into Titus 1. Now, Titus is a... A young man called a God, and Paul is his mentor. And we start off right away with this letter to Titus. And it starts off, it is necessary, or the reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone as I directed you. To appoint elders in every town, one who is blameless, husband of one wife, having faith, faithful children, not accused of wildness or rebellion, for an overseer as God's administrator must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, and self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught, so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. For there are also many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from Judaism. Have you ever met somebody that met this description of this last verse here? That, you know, they, they seem to talk a good talk, but Maybe not necessarily have a, maybe not all their eggs are uncracked. Uh, maybe they're rebellious in an area of their life or more than one area of their life. 
it can be a challenge because most people um, can say, you know, being a Christian is not so hard here, here, and here. But in this area over here, I don't know about that. Right? And you probably have areas of your own life that you had to work through where you got to where you are now, but you had to overcome something to get to that spot. It is necessary to silence them. They overthrow the whole households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Now, what a reputation is that? This testimony is true. So rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. That they may pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of men who reject the truth. To the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, and disqualified for any good work. Now, this kind of sounds like a harsh set of instructions from Paul to Titus about where he's sending them. Now, I don't know about you, but this kind of gets your attention, doesn't it? It kind of says, hmm, maybe <laughs> this is a bad place for me to go. You know, you're, you're, you're sending me to a, this group of people. Now, this is kind of a hard, hard sentence. I want you to go shepherd those Cretans over there, those lazy, lifeful, greedy people. You're going to go pastor them. I don't know. That sounds like a very fun trip, right? I'm supposed to appoint elders. And I don't have a very good population to appoint elders, but I'm supposed to look for blameless people, monogamous. What's that, Fred? It appears to be a hard stretch, right? Yet, <laughs> how many of you remember the conditions in which God found you in? And, and again, he begins a, a new work in you. He begins to take that old person. Sometimes he takes that old person out to the woodshed. Sometimes he buries that old person. But that old person can't stay. We have to become something new. But while you're in that old person's state, you know, you're kind of defiled. Paul continues on in Titus chapter 2. But you must say the things that are consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be level-headed, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. To be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind, and submissive to their husbands, so that God's message will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity 
and with dignity in your teaching. Your message is sound beyond reproach so that the opponent will be ashamed having nothing bad to say about us. Paul sets t- this set of instructions to Titus as kind of ha- high. And, and Paul is putting Titus as an equal. He's saying, your standard has to be high, as I have, like us. You have to be above reproach. You have to do everything out in the open. There can't be secrets in the dark. You have to be uh, out there. Here's one of the favorite verses. Slaves must be submissive to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back. And I'm not thinking that Siri's talking back. Or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God, our Savior, in everything. Now, this is an interesting concept here. We're to adorn the teachings of our Savior. How many of you think about that? What does it mean to adorn? To wear. Now, we've heard many sermons on the armor of the God, right? And you probably have even been told to, to mentally put on the armor of God every morning before you get out of bed, right? And, and how do you put on the armor of God? Read the word. Okay, what are the what are the components of the armor of God? Okay, so we're going to put on a breastplate of righteousness. And well, we can pick up the sword at the end. Helmet of salvation. We'll put that on second to last. We got a few things to put on. girdle or belt okay something that sucks <laughs> what else what else do we carry shield okay and, and we have right are we missing anything we talked about the sword. When we talked about the helmet, are we missing anything? It's a trick question. You know me. I, I have to throw trick questions. We, we've covered what Paul talks about, but there's two pieces of clothing that are mentioned in the Old Testament. The cloak... And the garment, cloak and garment, which, again, is as you adorn. So we're to adorn ourselves with the teachings. How do we do that? How do we adorn ourselves with the teachings? As we, as we imagine ourselves with the armor of God, we have to adorn ourselves with the teaching. It's an interesting concept because we may hear something and say, yes, that is true. But if we don't do what is true for that thing, are we adorning ourselves? So again, here's, here's a, a, a passage that is interesting for us to work our way through. Verse 11, for the, God, for the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age, while we wait for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our God great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
He gave himself for us to redeem us from lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Now I want everyone to say, eager to do good works. Are you eager to do anything? Are we eager to do anything? Fred, I think I heard you complain this morning that you, you aren't in your field because it's too wet. So you sound like there's an eagerness to get into the field, right? But are we eager to do good works? Just like you're eager to try to get into the field. So we're to adorn, but we're also to be eager. Adorn, eager. Hmm, all right. Say these things and encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So again, Titus is being sent to a, an unruly group of people. And he's like, don't put up with them bad talking you. Set things in order. Be deliberate. Rebuke where you need to rebuke. It's very precise here. Very precise. All right. He continues on. Be ready for every good work. To slander no one. To avoid fighting. And to be kind. Always showing gentleness to all the people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living with malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But the interesting thought here is in this original verse, be ready for every good work. Do we consider ourselves ready? What are you ready for? When you came to church this morning, were you ready for something? Are we mindful in this, these areas of, of the text here? Are we mindful of these things? But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, he poured out his he poured out this spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified by grace, we may become heirs with the hope. Of eternal life. Do we look at these passages and are we encouraged to be the best person that we can be? Are we encouraged to be <laughs> ready? Are we mindful to avoid fighting? It's an interesting thing because if you think about it, some of the most vigorous Christians, I know, are eager to argue about something. Right? How many of you have ever met somebody that's eager to argue? I know that as a high school student, I was eager to argue. I didn't even have to have an agreement with the side I was arguing for. It's like, I just, that was the thing I enjoyed. People thought I should have been a lawyer. Because I, I, I love to torment my teachers, to argue with them. But we are not to be that type of person. We are to be different. Um, 
You know, we anointed people with oil this morning. We laid on hands three different people. Some would say we did the minimum prescribed by the Scripture. The minimum prescribed by the Scripture. Now, if we analyze that, in our own life, how many of us want to do the minimum prescribed? Now, I look out here and I see mostly parents. Mike and Mike are not. But you were parented. So you, you, can, you can surmise this next part. You remember when you gave your kids chores. And in the effort to give your kids chores, there was several things that you looked at when you gave them a chore. One is you were looking at their desire to either do the minimum to get by or the desire to thrive. Right? Were you not measured by that when, when you did chores? Anybody here measured that by that? Was your allowance compensated by whether you thrived or the minimum to get by? It, when you saw your kids do the minimum to get by, wh how good was that? Right? I know that in the past I've done marriage counseling with individuals and I will suggest to a member of, the, of that try this and I can always tell you with those with the minimum get by attitude they're the first ones to say that didn't work I tried that but if you truly want to thrive it's not a limited minded exercise how many are understanding that? Do we want to thrive or do we want to do the minimum to get by? Going back to the anointing with oil. <laughs> do you guys remember the story where uh, the prophet was sent to Jesse's house to, to anoint the next king? Because Saul had abandoned uh, his heart's commitment to follow after God. And uh, Samuel stood there and Jesse brought out his firstborn. Nope, not that one. Bring me the next one. Nope, not that one. Bring me the next one. Nope, not that one. Bring me the next one. Went through all, all the list of kids. Yo, he's not here. Do you have an, any more? Um, we got this. This young man out in the back is shepherding the flock. Uh, technically, he's my son. Well, go get him. Short, scrawny, fiery kid shows up. And Samuel takes and pours the flask of oil on him. Drenches him with oil. We don't drench people with oil. Could you imagine... How many people would want to be anointed with the oil if we emptied the container out on each individual person and refilled it the next person? You're like, I don't want to get messy for church. Right? We do the minimum to get by. But do we really want the minimum results? We don't. There are a couple stories where Jesus healed people in the Bible. Have you ever read some of the stories that Jesus is healing? It seems like there's a pattern that he doesn't do the same thing ever. You ever notice that? This guy shows up to Jesus blind and one time he'll, he, he spits in the dirt. Takes it in multitude with his hands. May I, Fred? Slaps the spitty dirt in the guy's face. Hopefully you got the example without the spit. Many of us would cringe at that, right? Many of us were like, that's disgusting. But if you're blind and you can't see, spit on me. Spit on me. 
If I'm blind and I can't see, I'm desperate. I want the touch. Of course, there's another time where Roman centurion says, I'm not worthy of you coming to my house. Just say it. It will be done. All right. I haven't seen much faith like that in all the house of Israel. It will be done as you said. Boom. That very moment, his servant was healed. So it's interesting that as you read through this, sometimes there's an easy healing. and Sometimes there's not an easy healing. Sometimes there's spit in the dirt that has to be worked into the thing for the healing to take place. And I, I, I'm never I never cease to be amazed at the variety of the healings that you see in Jesus' day. Of course, there was you know that story where uh, the Syrian general showed up to the prophet's house. The prophet didn't even greet him. He didn't even open the door. He just yelled at him on the other side, go wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times. And he stomped off the porch and like, does he not know I could destroy that house? I could put it. And then people are like, Yo, if the prophet would have told you to go do this great feat to be healed from your leprosy, would you not do it? Well, of course I would have done it. Well, then do what he said. Go down to the Jordan River. He's got, I got cleaner rivers in my own backyard. Goes down and he dumps it. And I can imagine the first six times he's just stomping in. <laughs> soothing with attitude. And that seventh time he's like, all right. Walking in. I can just imagine the obedience that is brought forth when you do what doesn't make sense to you. How many of you know that sometimes God does things that don't make sense to you? Like oil on the head. I was thinking a lot more harder things than the oil on the head. But again, we're talking about advice this morning. For those who are with me, greet you. Greet those with love, who love us in faith. Grace be with all of you. Supporting past or scriptures. There's this verse in Matthew 10. Jesus is talking. Now, before I started this message, I did not realize this. But I'm going to give you a piece of information. And again, before I prepared for this morning's message, I would not have known this. Matthew 10 is the single most significant chapter in the Bible regarding worthiness. If you look up worthy or worthy, worth in the Bible, this is the chapter that speaks by far the most. 10% of all the matches of whether being worthy is found in Matthew 10. All right, just keep that in mind. The one who welcomes you, and again, he's sending out his disciples. He's, he's, he's sending out his disciples to minister to the people in, Jew, in Judea. The one who welcomes you welcomes me. The one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. Anyone who welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who welcomes a righteous person because he is righteous will receive a righteous person reward. Verse 42. Here's where it gets real simple. Whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple. I assure you, he will never lose his reward. Now, this is a strange passage in the midst of being sent. This is a passage that commands you to be sent. What is about one of the cheapest commodities on this planet? Water. A restaurant is not allowed to charge you for just water. Now, if you ask for bottled water, they're allowed to charge you for bottled water, but a restaurant it cannot charge you for water. This is one, the, and here is an example of a very cheap thing you can do: give somebody a cup of cold water that needs a drink. 
This is about as simple of ministry examples as you're going to get in all the Bible. Give a cup of cold water. Somebody who's thirsty. It's interesting, right? Now, having just said to you the value of Matthew 10 as a book that has a dozen mentions of being worthy or something being worth something, we have a couple passages that support the opposite. A worthless person is a wicked man that goes around speaking dishonestly. You know anybody that's dishonest? A worthless man digs up evil and his speech is like a scorching fire. Hmm. Hmm. A worthless witness mocks justice. A wicked mouth swallows inequity. We are to be people of truth. What we say should be truthful. Now this is an interesting idea because truth is more than a concept of functionality. Right? How many of you can actually speak the truth and lie at the same time? Fred, you got this look on your face. You think that's kind of hard? I'll give you an example. All right. I'll use me. I'm driving from Williston to Tioga. I have passengers in the back. We had just gone there to see somebody in the jail. And I'm driving back, and I have a headlight that's out. And uh, light flashes. Highway patrolman pulls me over. Uh, Mike, he's laughing at me. Mike's laughing at me. And this, this guy walks up to me and says, do you realize your headlight is out? I looked at him and said, my headlight is out? I spoke the truth. I intended to deceive. I quickly got convicted. I said, yeah, I know my headlight's out. Get it fixed. Okay. So we can speak the truth, intending to deceive. The deception is not honorable. So the truth is more than just speaking the functional truth but to live a truthful life. Now, Satan is the master of half-truths. Most of everything he says has a stream of truthfulness in it, but it's kind of off-kilter. And I know people that when they tell you a story of what happened to them, there's a window of about 70 percent of truthfulness to the story and 30 percent window of what they're concealing you know you 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 understand that right and that what they're concealing is intended to make themselves look good right because if they actually told you that 30 percent you'd walk out and say you should be taken to the woodshed for that <laughs> But we're to be people that speak honestly, to treat things honestly. We're to be ambassadors of honesty. So as we close out this morning, as we strive to look at the advice of God living in this world, let us be ready. Let us be eager Those are two things that we talked about, ready and eager. Let us be mindful of what comes out of our mouth. Let us be mindful that nothing evil is present in our mouth. Now that 
is a challenge. 2,000 years later, the church is still struggling, trying to keep gossip off our lips. It is still every bit of a challenge today as it was when the words were penned by our apostles. But let us be thoughtful to work on what's worth it. Now, you know, the interesting thing is back in Titus, there was some ideas about what, not getting into arguments. You know, not to, not to jump into, you know, the, the cheesy places of what to, what to argue about. You know, sometimes some things are just not worth arguing about. So how do we know what's worth arguing about and what's not worth arguing about? So I've got one thought for you. Um, and from a religious perspective, stick to the fundamental truths. And I say the fundamental truths meaning our published document as the assembly of God as our fundamental truths. Don't get wrapped up into arguments with subject matter beyond those areas. There's just not much fruitfulness there. And we want our lives to be fruitful. So let's not entertain arguments of non-fruitful material. All right. Let's stand. Do we have a closing hymn?